Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, looking forward to this interview again. Today we have a UFC featherweight prospect and uh, and a good friend of mine, Mike Grundy, who's going to, again, share some insights into his athletic background, his world, and what he does to allow him to compete at, um, at the highest level over and over again. So thanks, Mike, for joining us today. No worries, Andy. Thanks for having me on. Hey, <laughs> listen, it's always good to have a chat to you, you know that. Um, but one of the things I think I must do is hand the hand call over to yourself for people who are a bit unfamiliar, unaware of yourself, you know, especially those that maybe aren't, like myself, a fan of MMA. Just explain, you know, what you're about, who you are and where you got to. So first I started with freestyle wrestling when I was six years old, so I've done that a long time. Um, you know, I, my goal then was really to go to the Olympics, go to the Commonwealth Games and really succeed as a wrestler and to be as successful as I can. And then I transitioned to MMA 2011 time. I did my amateur career in uh, mixed martial arts. I went professional. Then obviously all my goal was then really to get to the UFC because if I'm involved in any sport or in anything I do, I want to be at the pinnacle the best. So, um, you know, I transitioned to mixed martial arts, did my professional career and, you know, I got an 11-1 and one record. Then I went, I got to the UFC, which was last year. And I got a 12-1 and one, one record now, won my debut last year in the UFC. So I'm, a, I'm a, where I want to be now, but still, for me, it's still in the beginning, really. I've still got plenty more to come. And, you know, it'll be going for that UFC title one day. Mate, and listen, we're all behind you. I think what you've humbly forgot to say is that you've achieved all of this while having still a really young family. Well, I know you're... Your eldest lad is getting bigger and looks more like taking you down more and more each day. And you, you've still got your own gym, haven't it? You're running. So I think the thing is, you're training at high intensity with some of the best fighters in the world. And you're still, you've still got a young family in your own business. Yeah, yeah. So we've got our own gym in Wigan as well, which is a gym, a commercial gym, which is um, weights, classes, um, and all, all that kind of stuff, really. People losing weight and whatever. Yeah. And then we've got all the fight classes as well, which we've run a wrestling club for a long time as well. Since I was 17, we started a freestyle wrestling club called um, Wigan Wrestling Club. So that's doing great. Plus we expanded on doing all the other classes as well, which is Team Carbon and Wigan. So we've got a lot going on. I've got a lot going on there business-wise business, business -wise as well. But, you know, I've got a lot of good people around me who help me out with, with that family. Really. It's a family-run gym, really. So, like I said, I've got a lot of people helping me so I can train full-time. And then, like you say, yeah, I've got, I've, got, I've got a wife and kids and, you know, they kind of fall into suit really as well because they're Jack, my eldest son, he's doing MMA, he's doing wrestling. Even my youngest son now, he's been, while we've been on lockdown, he's been coming to gym with me every day and doing a little circuit. We call it the Star Wars circuit, so he's still training. Fantastic. And then, you know, it, it all ties in really. They're all, they're all, they're all loving it. No, but I think, I think it's really nice because, you know, one of the things that, we see is a lot of, you know, a lot of full time. I think people don't appreciate that when they see, uh, you know, walking into the cage on the biggest stage in the world of MMA, that actually behind the scenes, there's an awful lot going on in people's lives that they've got to balance to get things right, haven't they? Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, to get to where I, I've got to and to get to the top of your sport, really, there's just a lot of, um, a lot of sacrifices. You know, there's a lot of pressure on your family at the same time. Do you know what I mean? So there's a lot of, a lot of, um, upsets, a lot of ups and downs really of your career but all I say really to people who ask any kind of questions about how do you get to where you've got to get to, I think it's just um, a lot of hard work you know, a lot of dedication and and put the time in and believe in yourself if you really believe and you can get to where you want to get to then you know that's half the battle really and, and I think one of the things that you know when you Okay, I've been surrounded, I've been, we've known each other quite a significant lot of time. And one of the things that people always associate with yourself is the graft, isn't it? And the hard work that you put in behind the scenes. And, um, you know, I think you touched on it, the fact that you actually started wrestling from six year old. Is that right? That's it, yeah. What got you into wrestling then, Mike? So wrestling, I mean, it was my brother, my oldest brother. He wanted to go and he went... Um, so I, I wanted to go as well. But there's that and plus the, the other side of things. I was quite a quiet, shy kid as well and didn't mix with kids too well. But So my mum and dad took me as well just to 
build my confidence up and bring me out my shell really a little bit as well, which it worked, you know, as soon as I got on that mat, kind of, it's like survival mode, you know, I was quite good at it, just staying out to certain areas easy and just being a little scramble, like my dad, my dad called me a runt, you know, like, I was a, I was a little runt he called me, you know what I mean, so it's, it, I just took to it quite well and, you know, I enjoyed it and the coach come to me and showed me a lot of interest and said you could be good and really took, took off from there, really. So that got you into the, the kind of, was it the England set up from there? Yeah, I mean, from, from being young age, obviously, you know, I trained at club level for a while. I trained with, first I started at a club in Aspel, which was Roy Woods, Roy Woods Club, which is called the Snake Pit now, which is cat, it's kind, of, it's kind of trying to reinvent cats wrestling, so cats wrestling's coming back around. But he coached me for a year or so, and then I changed um, to an American coach, a guy from America come over. His aim was to come over and get wrestling in schools over here because it wasn't that popular and basically build up a grassroots program for freestyle wrestling in England. So he was here, but he also had his own club. So I went there. So I had good basics from a wrestling coach who'd been to the Olympics for America. Right. So, um, you know, I had a good, good, good foundation from him, really. And then, yeah, obviously, when he went home, uh, he went home to America. I finished wrestling for a year or so. And then come back, and then I got on the English English program, really the the, the world class program. And that took yeah, that's then obviously taking you off along your journey to what for most people, especially in the wrestling world, has got to be the pinnacle of your career. You know, yeah. you get yourself a Commonwealth medal. I did eventually, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, went to, I went to two Commonwealth games, and you know, I went to the first one. Um, I was in 2010 in India. And then just like I drew, when, when you go to weigh in for your wrestling tournaments, I drew, um, you draw a number and I drew India, the first round in India. So bear in mind, wrestling's the one of the most popular sports over there. So they had thousands of fans and I'm against India first. And they proper played on it as well. Like the, the guy who came out from India, he had like a uh, music coming out. I come out to absolutely nothing. <laughs> just all his fans cheering him on. And then, um, you know, I felt the pressure. Anyway, I lost to India in the first round, come back and um, end up getting fifth overall in that Commonwealth game. So I felt there was a lot of unfinished business in wrestling. Yeah. It, and then took you to Glasgow. Yeah, I went, after 2010 Commonwealth Games, I went, that's when I went into MMA and started my amateur career. But... When I got when I when I heard obviously 2014 Commonwealth Games was going to be in Glasgow, I kind of thought you know what I might come back and and, and uh, go for it and because I felt I had some finished business because I always knew I had me in me to get a medal. 2010, like I said, I didn't succeed, so I um, I come back uh, a year before the Commonwealth Games and um, I come back and I won just after three. I had three years off. And then I just went and come back and I won the national championships um, in, in UK. And then, you know, I got picked to go to, to Glasgow. And then, yeah, I went to Glasgow and I, got, I did well, you know, I got a bronze medal. I was gutted it wasn't a goal, but, you know, still a good, good result. It is. And I think all of those kinds of, you know, you, you talk about your experiences in India and the, the pressure and the, the kind of, and then the disappointments of obviously... Okay, not getting the gold medal, but still coming back with something achieved. That must benefit you now going into, because you're getting used to the kind of, I mean, walking into the octagon, knowing that there's millions of people watching you in the UFC, you know, that must play a part still. So surely that's only going to help you. Of course, all that, what I've done in the past is experience. No, no, I kind of look back on my career in wrestling and think, you know, what was I playing? I kind of think laying stuff like that get to me. Do you know what I mean? No, it doesn't really get to me at all. Obviously, I get a little, the normal nerves beforehand. But to be honest, my nerves only come like a few weeks before the fight. When I'm on fight night, I'm, I'm not nervous. I'm excited. I'm excited to compete and fight. But um, like I said, all that experience from beforehand, it was, it's definitely helped me now in my career, 100%. And I, and I think that shows because, you know, when I watch you, especially like walking down, you always do look very relaxed. I mean, especially your last fight, even though I think it was... You know, people explain that you are, and you quite openly said that you, you had an injury going in. That one yeah. of the things you did is that was probably one of the best performances I've ever seen you do, especially them fast hands. 
Yeah, a lot of people comment. I mean, I think, you know, um, obviously I tore my hamstring just before that fight, which was two and a half, like two and a half weeks before that fight. Luckily enough, I have uh, Summit Physio on hand, you know what I mean? <laughs> every, day, every day I was in, in your place, you know that. Um, getting treatment on that, so that helped out a lot. But fight night, you know, I still come out to fight and um, in the warm-up area before I was going to fight, I still could feel my hamstring, you know, and before I walked out, I thought, I'm probably not going to be able to wrestle too much. So I come out and box, and it was probably a blessing in disguise, really, because, I, you know, I've got TKO that I've always needed and wanted. No, it was brilliant. I mean, it's still, I mean, many people won't know this story, but I think it was the Wednesday before the Friday, Mike was travelling up to see, uh, to Glasgow, where he's, where he's in full prep, ready for the Commonwealth Games. Mike was actually taking, my ambulance driver taking me to A&E. After oh, I yeah. I <laughs> up to my Achilles in his gym. Yeah. So that was, that, was our pre, that was our final prep session, wasn't it? Ready. Yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. that. So, I think I, <laughs> I think I, I think I, uh, I shocked you more in that day where you're all pushing your your finger into where my Achilles should be. I think that that gave you all the entertainment as you you threw me into A and E and said good luck to you later. I'm off to Glasgow. Yeah. You took so, it well. Well, me <laughs> it was good though. Anyway, we got back. We're all good now. So talk about this transition. What what was the what was the thing that made you then transition into MMA from wrestling? So even before, when I, when I was still wrestling and pursuing my wrestling career, I went up to Team Cabot in Liverpool just to really help, help Terry Atim. Mike Terry Atim was in the UFC. I think he'd had one fight then in the UFC, but he was coming up against a wrestler. And um, a guy, Shane Rigby, was the wrestling coach down there. And Shane said to me, would you come down to, to Team Cabot? I went in Liverpool to just train with Terry and wrestle with Terry, really just so he can get some wrestling in before he fights in the UFC against this guy who's more of a wrestler. So, yeah, I went down and, you know, I wrestled him. I went down to the sparring days and wrestled Terry and stuff like that. And I, t- I, tried, I tried out some jiu-jitsu after the class and I enjoyed it. You know, I, I loved it. Just, I mean, wrestler saying that he can squeeze on someone's neck and crank on his neck, you, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's good, isn't it? So, um, I proper enjoyed it. And the coach, Colin, Colin said, you know, would you, would you ever be interested in doing MMA? And Shane asked me, you know, a few people asked me around the gym, would I ever be interested in doing mixed martial arts? I said, yeah, but I'd probably, I'd probably do it after the 2012 Olympics. <laughs> because obviously my goal was always to go to the Olympics, and especially 2012 we'd been in London. That was, that was where I wanted to be. And that's what I was on the world-class programme for. But after 2010 Commonwealth Games in India, I kind of fell out with wrestling a little bit just due to some politics, really, within wrestling. So I decided to go to mixed martial arts in 2010, 2011. And, you know, I trained more in the stand-up side of things. Obviously, Colin, Colin Aaron is um, one of the best, stri- well, the best striking coach in the world, in my eyes. Best mixed martial arts coach in the world, in my eyes, as well. So uh, that's where I went, and that's where I've always been ever since, really. I'm kind of loyal to that team. And, and and I think that team, all the fighters from that team seem very loyal, don't they? You know, all the elite lads that have been there, you know, they're all very loyal to Colin Wood. So that, I mean, it's a fantastic community. And I can't, unfortunately, have you on interviewing about this without asking you what life is like. Well, prior to, obviously, the current situation, what the, what the mood in the camp was like, because it's quite a team they're all putting together again now. Yeah, I mean, it's always been there, you know what I mean? Obviously, after that, the Terry Etting, Matt Scano, Paul Kelly, all then, you know, it was kind of a while until, until we got somebody else back in the UFC, which was Till. We got Till, Till got back in the UFC, you know, and, and then kind of me and Tom now have followed suit. But yeah, I mean, it's always, you know, the vibe's always good in Liverpool. It's, um, it's a hard, hard training. I mean, like, I've wrestled all my career, but the hardest training is probably... This year and now, where I'm in this year and now, where I'm um, training at Team Cobb and in Liverpool under Colin because Colin, you know, he demands perfection. And Colin's, you know, you want to you go into training wanting to impress Colin, and it's almost impossible to impress Colin, so that's why you train so hard. So, I guess the question could be, you know, you know, one of the things that you know I'm very familiar with, and then those that people that are follow yourself or any of the carbon lads understand that is the yeah you do train at such a high level so how do you manage to keep at such a high level of training and almost deal with the, the injuries and the niggles that you must get on a regular basis 
so for me, obviously, the the, the main time of my hardest my hardest training is when I'm in camp. You know, I mean, I'm always training year round. I train twice a day year round, but it slightly changes ten weeks out. You know, your training gets a little bit more intense. Um, but I mean, the way obviously I deal with it is I make sure one. I'm not just saying it because I'm on your you talking to you, but <laughs> is making sure I get me something to physio in every single week. You know, and I do, you know, I have a massage every week to make sure I can get my recovery in because training is so hard, you know, your muscles are so tired and stuff, it's so easy to get injured. Especially, you know, you're kicking and punching and taking each other down. There's so many ways you can get injured as well. So, you know, just staying on top of that, that recovery side of things is very important. You know, two times a week I make sure that I either, I'll go to the sauna once a week and then I'll also go, go to, to, to you guys once a week, which helps me a lot. Obviously, I mean, that's just... I probably didn't do as much as I like to do it, but using the cryopheripher, oh, sorry, the um, remind me of the name, Andy. The, um, the hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Yeah, yeah. that one. <laughs> so, obviously, I've used that a few times, which yeah. I think is probably beneficial. So, you, you know, I've done a lot of research on it now, and I think that's important to use. Yeah, I mean, that's something we're obviously exploring with athletes like yourself as well, isn't it? And into the effectiveness of that. So that's cool. I mean, what injuries? So for people that, you know, think you've had it easy, you've done a bit of training, but you've had some quite big injuries, haven't you? Yeah, I've had quite a few injuries. <laughs> um, mainly like, I've had, a, I've had a, probably four or five ligament tears on my knees, um, shoulders, I've had a shoulder up, um, neck, I've got a, I've probably got, I've got a thing in eye. Um, Inflamed bulging disc, is it called? You'll know more, Andy. I had an X-ray on that, and that, that's what come back with that one. So yeah, there's a lot of niggles and injuries, um, but no, no career-ending injuries really. But I'm saying like I've got a lot of it, a lot of injuries that I've got to be maintained really. Well, how do you, and how do you deal with them mentally, Mike? Are you, you know, I know you've, you've you know, you, you kind of expressed before that you know, as, as I guess you've got older, even though you're not old, but as you've kind of matured through your career. You're obviously the mental side of your game has gone up. Is that a big factor in how you cope with those injuries? Because I know you've had the shoulder was a was a was an issue for quite a while, and you were still fighting with a bad shoulder for quite a significant time before you decided to have the op. So, how do you deal with that mentally? Yeah, it is tough. You know, like you say, mentally it does. You know, being mentally prepared does help. I mean, I always kind of see it when I get an injury, or if I come across an injury is there is always a still a way to train. You know, if I hurt my leg, I can train my you know, body type thing. Yeah. You know, if I hurt my shoulder, I can still jog, I can still stay fit, I can still do stuff. Um, so that's the way I've always kind of got to look at, look at We've got to try and find a positive, really, in everything in that sense. So whatever injury's got, there's still definitely always something you can kind of do. I think the probably worst injury I've had, though, was worse. it was actually last year, was my rib. Now, it wasn't the most thing, but there was a lot of things I couldn't do because of it so that was frustrating but and then you know I kind of switched my head switched it over and my mental game was just like okay I can't do too much training wise so what I'll do is I'll concentrate on uh, on my diet kind of thing and something I can do within my diet that's gonna you know expand my knowledge or still keep my weight down so I'm kind of ready and fit and ready to go when I can start training fully and I think that's the, the thing a lot of people can learn from People that are at the top level is the fact is, you know, unfortunately stuff has happened, doesn't it? You know, as much as we can do to prevent injuries, things like you say, rib injuries, especially in MMA, one, I guess they can happen at any time because there's a variety of ways it can happen. And secondly, from a physio perspective, there's, no, there's not an awful lot we can do to really help bar putting you in the environment to let it heal. No, and that's when I use the, um, the chamber, hyperbaric chamber, yeah. really. Because it's probably only one of the things I could do. There's nothing much. I mean, I don't remember you giving me some some exercises I could do when I said, after a few weeks of it settling down, a couple of um, exercises that I did, plus going in the chamber. So, you know, there wasn't much I could do. But mentally, like I said, I kind of concentrated on something that was positive that could help me as an athlete. And, and that's one of the things that I've always admired about you, that even when there is hiccups on the road, you know, you've always found a very positive approach and, and, a, and a, a right mindset almost to face it and take it on, which is one of the reasons I personally think why you are achieving stuff and why you will go on to achieve what, you, what you, you're destined to become once we, uh, unless Dana buys his private island soon or the fact that we, uh, you know, we come out of this scenario. 
So for those people that do, you know, obviously when we, when we look at you, you're a very athletic young man, you know, so you obviously train at quite high intensity and stuff. So what would you give people that like to go to the gym, like to train, maybe they're at the, uh, you know, thinking about coming into MMA? What would, you, what would you advise them to do the best way to try and avoid uh, either getting injured or to help with their recovery? You know, what simple things could people be doing that you've learned works really well for you? Um, I mean, one, obviously, don't overtrain, which I've done a lot. <laughs> you know, don't, don't, oh, definitely don't overtrain, but, you know, it's very, overtraining is obviously very easy to do, especially when you've got a goal and you've got ambitions to be something. It's so easy to overtrain, but that's one thing, you know. Um, and, you know, definitely seek out a good physio, uh, making sure you're getting them that recovery and a massage. Or if you've got any niggles, address them early. You know, um, don't let it, don't try and train through through any kind of niggles and injuries. I'd definitely, I'd say, you know, seek out info and, and you know, get, get them treated quite quickly, really. Eating well and nutrition is important. For your um, for for any kind of injuries as well, if you if you if you're training, but yeah, I mean, just basically enjoy it, enjoy enjoy the process of it all. And I think, well, I think that comes down to you know, I, I don't think you can. I think if you don't enjoy it, then and your heart's not in it, you know, one of the things we always see with you, you've always got a smile on your face when they, when we see pictures of you training or walking out, you know, you know, you do always seem to absolutely and utterly embrace and enjoy the challenge of what it brings to you. You know, which is which is great to see, and I'm sure everyone loves watching that. You know, and I think you made a really good point about the overtraining. So, yeah. what you know, to, what you know, I see something that people do. Again, they're very ambitious to achieve stuff in any sport. It might not be MMA; it could be any kind of thing. You know, what's the first key signs would you say to somebody to make sure that that they're aware that they're overtraining? What what kind of symptoms would you get, or were you getting if you, when you did overtrain? So I mean, one is uh, just when you get up in the morning, just not wanting to, just having the the thing of not wanting to go training sometimes as well. And I mean, what was the thing you know? So uh, what I do as well when I when I get up, I can feel I know when I've overtrained anyway, but I check my heart rate every morning as well. When I'm in camp, anyway. so I'll check my heart rate and I know if it's, a, if it's higher than usual. One, obviously it could be I'm getting I'm coming down with any sort of bit of illness or something like that, but also, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a sign of overtraining. So that's, that's, that's a couple of things really and just yep. being motivated really is just one as well, you know. I mean, you should be going to training, wanting to train and enjoying it. Yeah. I think it's important because one of the things that we see in clinic an awful lot of time is that that those signs of overtraining, which and especially in sports or competitions, you know, in all combat sport where you have to make weight, if it's a jiu-jitsu competition or if it's, you know, if it is wrestling or they are looking to MMA or they're going to go into strength training and there's, there's a weight class thing, then whatever you are cutting weight, and you, you're training high, then you always are putting yourself at high risk. So I think there's some really nice little tips there for people to kind of listen to their own body and make good decisions, really, don't they? Yeah, that's it. You just, like I say, you, just, you just said it really. You've got to listen to your own body, really. And, you know, when you're getting fatigued and tired, and like I say, you, I, check, I like checking my heart rate because that just kind of, I know my own body, and that's what kind of what he's saying. I'm either over training or I'm coming down with something, but my heart rate is just a little bit higher. You know, and, and that's what I kind of go off really. I mean, motivation side of things as well. So if you don't feel motivated, then that's normally a sign I just need to cut back somewhere. Yeah. But the other thing I would say that you, you, you know, that you haven't mentioned, but I know about you is that, well, you, you're very good at listening and taking advice, aren't you? You know, I know you've got your S&C behind the scenes. I know you've got, you've had your nutritionist and stuff. So one of the things you fully embrace is the fact of, you know, Many of these might not know, and I hope you don't mind saying, but when Mike set his goal on the UFC, he actually spent a lot of time researching a lot of people who would be the best camp behind the scenes to help him achieve what he wants to achieve. And I think that's something which I've always liked about yourself is your, your methodical way of applying yourself, don't you? You know, you're not just one of these, I'm going to get my head down and just graft. You're going to do this in the most scientific and best way to do it. Yeah, that's just, just a positive approach and 
and like I said, and like I said, really just gotta to listen to people who know what they're on about. I mean, I'll listen to to anybody, do you know what I mean? And I'll take what I can from it. Do you know what I mean? So people who've not even really been involved in MMA, for example, but they're trying to tell me something, something about it, and I'll listen and I'll take what I can from it. You know, and I'll, there's always something to take from it. I'd say, especially you know, like say, obviously if you're telling me something to do within physio, I'm going to listen to it. Do you know what I mean? It's what you've done all your career, so um, <laughs> you've got to. Well, you've got, you've got to. You've got to <laughs> advice, aren't you? You know. Yeah, you do. You do. So I have to ask you, what's next? What's on the? Is, what's the next plan once we're, we're allowed to get back in that cage again? Well, we kind of had a we had a bit of a like an online meeting with Dana the other day. All the athletes could could log into this thing and we, we could speak. Well, we could listen to what Dana had to say. and We could ask him some questions and stuff. But Dana's kind of come on and just said that is this fight island. Have you heard about the fight island? No. So basically, he's saying he's got a he's got a private yeah. 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 And, you know, he's got private planes and stuff. So for all the international fighters, which is like us, like he was supposed to fight in London, he's saying that we're, we'll be fighting on there or we have the opportunity to fight on there, this private island, um, because obviously we can't fly into America and stuff like that, fight in America. And then obviously there's a lot, we're on lockdown here, so we can't really fight here. So he's saying that this is, this is, uh, this is real and it's going to go ahead. He says it'll be ready by the end of May, early June. Right. You know, he kind of said, but... He, um, he totally understands if we don't want to fight because maybe we're not ready or we can't cut the weight or we don't feel safe due to the pandemic. He said he said he under totally understands all that side of things, but he says if you want to if you want to fight, then there'll be a fight there for for everyone kind of thing. So I'm happy with that, and you know I'm definitely up for fighting. I'll <laughs> definitely. <clears throat> I mean, you can say they've been flown on a private jet to a private island and been paid to fight there. You know what I mean? So. Not many people. Hello? Oh.